Welcome to The Lost Word. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky, and tonight we have Father Tony Sylvia of the Apostolic Johannite Church. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this new show. Absolutely. <laughs> and we are fortunate to be here tonight in Salem, Massachusetts at the wonderful Hermetic Arts Learning Center, and I want to thank David Newman for allowing us to use this space. I appreciate it very much. Mm. So this evening, we're going to talk about the Secret Chiefs primarily. Uh, I want to use the concept and subject of the Secret Chiefs to explore different approaches to esotericism. Uh, The practitioner approach and the academic approach. I think two strong methods or schools of analysis, um, but they each have their pros and cons, and we'll explore that uh, using the secret chiefs as our subject. So the subject of the secret chiefs is controversial, Mm -hmm. it's important, and it lies at the heart of many, if not all, esoteric traditions. They certainly played an important part in the founding of the traditions that would go on to become the mother traditions of a lot of other groups. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, the first time I ever encountered the idea of the secret chiefs in a historical sense was uh, with the rite of strict observance in the late 1700s, Baron von Hund. Uh, they, you were there, right? You're, Hundreds of years ago, my recollection, uh, they swore allegiance to an unknown superior. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first example of any esoteric group openly, well, not openly, but acknowledging that they took their direction from someone or something else. There's a lot of examples of this after the late 1700s. Um, Just to go through them as briefly as I can, you have people like the Count of Saint Germain, supposedly a physical man, but has evolved into an ascended master figure. Um, I think Beyond that, um, the next time this idea really pops out is uh, the Theosophical Society with Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott and and several of the other high-ranking members of the Theosophical Society. And they had several named Mm -hmm. entities who were secret chiefs. Um, The Psychical Research Society in England tried to debunk them. Uh, and depending on your point of view, may have successfully done so. Uh, K. Paul Johnson, here we get back to the academic approach to this, written in his book, The Masters Revealed, Madame Blavatsky, and the Myth of the Great White Lodge. Uh, I think it's important when we're talking about these things, the idea of myth or war uh, doesn't necessarily mean something is factually incorrect. Mm. So, it, well, in this book, Johnson has identified the supposed secret chiefs to actual living people, mm-hmm. which I think is important. And the research he's done is convincing in, to some extent, depending on your point of view. But I don't believe that that means that the acceptance of the idea of these being real living physical people means that they were not right. secret chiefs mm-hmm. for the Theosophical Society. What right. are your thoughts about that? Well, I, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think that for a lot of people who want to believe in a literal, supernatural understanding of the secret chiefs, and a lot of people come to esotericism just for that kind of romanticism and that glamour, and, um, that you have a uh, you have this picture in your mind of a, of a shadowy figure who can appear and disappear at will. But 
in a in a sense, it, certainly in a Gnostic sense, you can look at it as that these are the people who would be the saints um, who had achieved a certain theosis, a certain level of, of oneness with the divine while they were alive, and that they can um, they can transcend when they want to, and they can they have information from the higher spiritual realms that they can share with the, the, the people of the world. So I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction to say that you have these secret chiefs who drive the, the actions of the order, and they're actually living human beings. I don't think that you can that there's necessarily a conflict there, although I can see how some people might be disappointed. Absolutely. Um, I think anyone who has a either-or approach is going to find this subject difficult. Mm. Uh, There's a lot of that in, in Gnosticism specifically, but in esotericism in general. It's, it, it's, a, it's not necessarily one or the other. Sometimes it's both, and sometimes it's a subtle mix of the two. Yeah, nuance, I think, nuance is very important when looking at these subjects, because um, fundamentalism on one side or the other, that's, that's what tends to cause the problems, in my opinion. I would agree with you. Um, this idea of the secret chiefs in theosophy, um, before we depart from Blavatsky, uh, I want to mention um, her cohort, uh, Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, uh, encountered these secret chiefs, uh, physically, supposedly, mm -hmm. on more than one occasion. And I think it's worth mentioning that Colonel Olcott had a reputation as a man of the utmost integrity. Mm -hmm. um, he led investigations into corruption after the Civil War. Um, he was always regarded by everyone who knew him as a very upstanding, forthright, honest person. Did he also have something to do with the investigation of Lincoln's assassination? I believe so, yeah. yeah. I think there's other things to mention. Um, the idea that being in the presence of these secret chiefs was often physically challenging mm -hmm. or uncomfortable. People would report things like intense headaches, hmm. nosebleeds, um, and various uh, other difficult reactions to just being around them for any length of time. Hmm. We should probably tell the story about the time we met one. I, I think, think yeah, <laughs> I think that would, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, um, we were, uh, what was 2009? Yeah. Was maybe I even 2008. Was 2008. <clears throat> um, we were having a meetup in uh, Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Yeah. And it was you and I, and then, um, uh, and then this older gentleman walked in and sat down. He knew everybody, and well, he knew a lot about everything. First, he he was, I don't know, I would say five foot six. Yeah, yeah. Mid to late 60s. Yeah, probably. Uh, white hair. Yeah. Long beard. Yes. All in black. Yep. <laughs> His name was John. Right, just John. But he didn't give a last right. name. And when we asked him what his interest was, he said hermeticism, mm -hmm. and that's it. He told us he had a fully equipped Enochian temple mm -hmm. with the holy table, the right. wax, I didn't even know what that meant the wax time, yeah. seals, <laughs> um, and his primary focus seemed to be Enochian magic. Yeah, and I think when I asked him. How does one become involved in such a group? Uh, he was more or less like, you know, don't even yeah. think about it. <laughs> don't call us, we'll call you kind of thing, right? Yeah. And, and he knew everyone personally. Yeah. yeah. Every author we could name who was living and who maybe even recently departed, he knew them all personally. And it didn't feel like name dropping either. No, no. It wasn't like uh, you know he was trying to impress us. I mean, who are we? <laughs> At that point, yeah, I mean, we weren't even on anybody's radar. No, no, no. It was a, it was interesting, an interesting little diversion. But when he walked out, I've never heard or seen from him no, again. Right, right. But you know, 
those. Yeah. Um, but he was he was an actual physical person, as far as I could tell. I, I didn't experience any headaches or anything. But, Thankfully, you know. <laughs> maybe toned down the might energy might for <laughs> us, knowing we were mere neophytes. Uh, I'm glad we got that story on camera. I don't think we have that recorded right. anyplace. Yeah, that was, that was a classic moment. Yeah, I remember going home from that meeting and just being really confused as to who it was that we had just sat with. Yeah, since he knew everyone and everything yeah. about it all seemingly yeah he really did he really did you know what it taught me too that when you have somebody like that in front of you if you don't know the right questions to ask <laughs> you're not going to find out anything right it's true yeah i mean i was just giving a presentation on the history of esoteric orders or something like that i, I think yeah, yeah. He he seemed like it. Would, he seemed like he had been there. <laughs> yeah, he, he intimate knowledge of it. That was fascinating. Mm. Yeah, anyway, all right. So to get back to the Theosophists, mm -hmm. and I think the advantage in Johnson's approach, academic approach, in analyzing these people, these secret chiefs as real people, is. Unlike the esoteric approach, which says the secret chiefs are real, they are of the numinous, and they are guiding us. Mm -hmm. The academic approach is not saying this is or it isn't. He's basically gathered evidence and he presents an argument. Mm -hmm. Not a legal argument, but an academic argument. It may convince you, it may not. The purpose is not necessarily to convince you. Mm -hmm. The purpose is simply to provide evidence that his conclusion to his argument is valid. Right. And he does that brilliantly, in fact. Um, but does he approach it, Does or does he conclude at the end that there's any spiritual value to having these secret chiefs? Or does he just talk about the, you know... This person was here on this date, and he said this thing. It's, uh, I think, and I think partly because of who he is. Johnson's an academic, but he is also, to my knowledge, interested in these subjects from a non-academic perspective. He, the people he identifies as secret chiefs are both political and essentially religious leaders of mm -hmm. uh, communities, uh, whether they are Sikh or Hindu, mm -hmm. um, but that these are essentially holy men to some degree. Mm -hmm. He also points out the, the political dimensions of the Theosophical Society's activities and that these political activities are directly related to these spiritual slash political figures, right? I mean, we we recall that the the Theosophical Society were largely responsible, maybe not largely responsible, but certainly influential in the Indian nationalist movement. Um, you know, in the years uh, leading to and following, I think the uh, Indian independence. Gandhi was a member of the Theosophical Society. Yeah, yeah. So certainly having these. Um, spiritual and political leaders on your side during a, a time as politically charged as that would have been pretty useful, I think. Yeah. It was, in a word, anti-colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing the secret chiefs do from the practitioner standpoint is they provide spiritual authority. Mm -hmm. when you they can, connect to the egregore of whatever tradition. Yeah, know. when the physical leader can stand before the group and say, I answer to mm -hmm. them, a higher authority that you all do not have connection with directly. Right. So it, what it does is it invests a great deal of power with the leader. It um, also can lead to corruption and, and all kinds of badness as well. Sure, so, yeah. <laughs> it certainly can. Yeah. So I think, you know, looking at this 
secret chief's idea from the academic side, from the practitioner side, um, I think it allows you to, or anyone studying it, to get a glimpse into the different facets of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it can be simply explained away by saying, you know, the, whatever the lore of, of an esoteric order is, is factually valid right. versus they're just physical people or it's non-existent. Yeah. You know? So these are examples of this phenomenon that are pretty, unless we're talking about the, the individuals themselves producing these works, the Book of the Law or mm -hmm. the Enochian Alphabet, an entire magical system, they were not received from other physical right. people. Right. They came. Right, they don't claim to be, right? Right. Yeah. So, and, and I think both of these things have aspects to them that would lead one to think that. Uh, there's something else involved. Well, those those kinds of stories are much more common, actually, among the the spiritual traditions of the world. It's more. It's much more often that a disembodied spiritual being that has no claim towards you know personhood mm -hmm. is the one dictating the 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 text or you know whatever it happens to be or founding the mm -hmm. the order. So you know, claiming that you actually interact with people who call themselves secret chiefs, or, you know, that's that's a relatively recent... Yes, uh, good point. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder, because even outside the bounds of the esoteric tradition, if we look back into the world's mythic mm -hmm. traditions, you're hard-pressed to find a single culture that doesn't claim that everything that they were taught in terms of language, writing, architecture, agriculture, right. government was all given to them by, by the gods, yeah. the gods mm -hmm. or by, um, they have many different forms of, you know, a lot of times we hear of the, the fish man, mm -hmm. the, the man who uh, dressed as a, as a fish, having scales or something came out of the water or came mm -hmm. out of a giant dragon or something of this nature. Right, or Prometheus bringing fire, yeah. Yeah, so these, um, am I advocating taking them literally? No, but I think it's important to realize that whoever came up with these things, if it was a real person, they in no culture did they want credit for it, is what it right. seems like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next thing I'd like to, to focus on is the, the more modern manifestation of secret chiefs and... Well, this is kind of what I'm interested actually in hearing from you because you are you are an academic, you are studying at Harvard, you know, you're getting your graduate degree and, and all that, and, but you are also a practitioner. So, you know, uh, what do you encounter when your your professors and you know your fellow students and things? Do they think that you're nuts, <laughs> or do you not talk about it? Uh, personally, I am not that open mm -hmm. with my fellow students and professors as I might yeah. like Although to be. Although a quick Google search would probably... Certainly, yeah, yeah <laughs> certainly would. But um, I have not encountered much resistance to esoteric tradition or ideas. In fact, it's my experience has been the exact opposite. The professors out of the Harvard Divinity School uh, you know, whether it's the history of transcendentalism in New England or mm -hmm. what, I don't know. But uh, almost every class I've had with one of these divinity professors, uh, the ideas of Gnosticism or um, depending on the religious faith we're looking at, Sufism, uh, esoteric Christianity, um, the Merkava tradition, uh, these things are all seen as valid important things to study in a anthropological curiosity sense or in a living spiritual tradition sense well i think in more of a historical sense mm -hmm. because uh to their minds they may not even be aware of the modern manifestations of oh, these okay. things that's interesting 
um, or that you know these things might be reconstructions. Of, well, I got to tell you, traditions. I can't. I couldn't tell you how often I hear people come up to me and say, "Oh gosh, I didn't think there were still Gnostics. I thought they were all dead, and the church wiped them out and burned their eyeballs and whatnot." Yeah, and I think that that is an interesting point. And these are people who probably don't necessarily immediately think of the idea that you don't need to have a physical living person carry that torch. Ideas are something that can be carried in a book. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, a thought mm -hmm. can come to someone, or they might hear a voice in meditation. Um, there's a lot of different ways these things can be passed down through the ages. And I think calling it a reconstruction is probably a disservice. Now, the modern example that I have seen recently is the Golden Dawn. Um, you have a number of different Golden Dawn orders under different leadership and slightly different names. Um, one of these groups claims that they are in contact with the same secret chiefs that Mathers uh, was in contact with mm -hmm. in the original Medic Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, other Golden Dawn leaders have decried this and called bullshit. <laughs> um, in fact, Nick Farrell's been very, very vocal on his website uh, over the past summer and several months, issuing a public challenge to the Secret Chiefs. Since he is the head of the Golden Dawn Order, he requested a meeting with the Secret Chiefs if they were real. And interestingly enough, he had a meeting with someone. <laughs> now, he says the person he met with did seem to know, uh, es have esoteric knowledge, uh, claimed to have advanced esoteric knowledge that he might share uh, under certain conditions. Farrell rebuffed him, and because he felt this is a regular human being, anything he gives me is going to be at uh, a price, whether it's control or access mm -hmm. or whatnot, and he refused. Um, it's possible that these people are the same people in touch with David Griffin's order. Uh, it's possible that they're not. It's possible that they may not reveal who they are in a coffee shop. If it were me, I think I would take a more traditional approach to the secret chiefs. Uh, maybe not a public approach, maybe mm -hmm. more of a uh, contact me during meditation approach. Sure, right, right, right. Um, I think Discounting the idea of secret chiefs is troubling um, for me as, as someone who's got like a foot in both of these worlds because my own experience with entities referred to as angels leads me to believe that whether this is something internal or external, there's something going on here. And uh, discounting a similar-ish phenomenon because it goes by a different name is seems foolish. Mm. But I don't I don't necessarily understand uh, the same way someone approaching this from outside, just strictly right, academically. Right. Um, if you're rational, if if you don't have any kind of strong religious faith, or you're an atheist, uh, you're a materialist, mm -hmm. these ideas seem very far-fetched, if not completely ridiculous. <clears throat> There's some of that in, in Gnostic scholarship as well, because very few of the Gnostic scholars, the big the big name Gnostic scholars, are, you know, are Gnostic in any way, shape, or form. They're just interested in the material. Um, and they're largely respectful about it. Uh, you know, they don't say, you know, look at these wacky Gnostics, not the way that Irenaeus did and some of the other heresy hunters. Um, you know, they have a genuine 
academic interest in the kind of historical anthropological phenomena that surrounded this, these groups. Um, but yeah, you know, the, they're not terribly excited about modern Gnostic groups, which you know, who, who, I, I couldn't blame them necessarily, but, uh, you know, Elaine Pagels uh, is, is an Episcopalian, I believe, and you know, she does she does a respectable job talking about the Gnostics and what they actually did and believed and taught, but it's there's something missing. Now, I, I would say that some of the academics recently involved in studying esotericism, they may not be practitioners, but they're able to approach it almost from that perspective. I think uh, Arthur Versus, I mangled his name, I apologize, but um, he's done this several times. Um, the one book that really stands out for me was, I think, The uh, Philosophy of Magic, or it might be Philosophy of Magic and Alchemy. And several chapters in that book, I, as I read it, I, was, I felt like this could be a grade paper for mm. some esoteric order. And to find that in a book written by a professor is extraordinary to me. And I think to someone who is looking for the insider's point of view, um, there's very few substitutes for going to directly to those texts. Yeah. And you read Manley Hall yeah. or Paul Case or Dion Fortune or Aleister Crowley or Rigardi, they're going to give you the tradition as they've lived it. There's really no substitute. And that's why I feel like being able to look at it through both lenses is really, really important for me. Um, and I know other people appreciate that, that point of view, um, but there are massive drawbacks, I think, to both of these um, perspectives in, in some ways. We talked about uh, academics and the study by academics being called a false tincture. Mm. Um, people you know, having no respect for academics or academics not having any respect for practitioners. Um, people painting broad brush strokes and stereotyping, generalizing. I think that has historically kept them apart mm -hmm. as much as in many senses today I, I feel like it's coming much closer together. So the Jesuits, I think you could argue are an esoteric order, although they're very public. Um, what have they done? They run universities. Mm -hmm. Do we, is that what we need to be focused on long term? If, if, if people are really interested in, in marrying the esoteric tradition to more legitimate academic study and, and teaching and promulgation of those traditions, is it worthwhile to look at some form of more institutionalized learning as opposed to grade papers and study groups? Well, there's, there's problems inherent in that, in that is, um, you know, you're not necessarily talking about skills that are quantifiable. Right. Uh, in, in an esoteric order, you know, you're not necessarily talking about things that you can... I mean, you should be able to repeat them. That is kind of the idea of it. But, you know, you're not necessarily... You're not going to get an assignment, complete the assignment, and A plus B equals C every time. Mm. Um, this is a, a question that, I, in my mind, because... This is, I think, a step in distinguishing between a tradition and a more formalized thing we might call religion. Okay. Hmm. 
And not everybody has that goal. I know many or most esoteric orders probably are not interested in that. But there are some that are. I often think about this because I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm slightly disillusioned with the occult at the moment. Um, and part of that is my own fault. But uh, it just seems to me that there is a lot of, there's an awful lot of stuff out there that is really kind of useless. I mean, not, I won't certainly name names or anything, but there's a lot of information out there that people are putting forth that's just kind of rehash of old stuff and, mm-hmm. and broken rehashes of old stuff at that. And and it just doesn't seem to me to be, well, let's put it this way. There's the tradition of secrecy that exists in esotericism generally. I think it's its biggest, um, obviously, it's its, it's its biggest uh, hindrance towards academic study because by its very nature you're not supposed to tell outsiders about the secrets of your order and all of that stuff so you know it's the only thing that scholars would have access to that's been written down is stuff that is either made up because that happens I mean it certainly happened about masonry you know all those many years ago when people were still secret about Freemasonry um or it's, you know, people who are disgruntled former members and have an extra grind. Um, but couldn't, I mean, I think I could make a fairly convincing argument that the Golden Dawn tradition and Thelema, whatever secrets there are, are really hidden in plain sight and are mostly a matter of the student understanding what they're presented with or what the symbols mean. Right. That's not exactly what I'm saying, though. Um, was it, uh, Dion Fortune has a quote, and I'm going to mangle it, but it's something to the effect that um, the real secrets of magic aren't stuff, you know, aren't what you can read in the books or read in the rituals or, or whatever. It's, it's the, the inner work that is done once you encounter those experiences. Um, and an academic isn't going to do that either. No, I agree. I, and I do think those are the real secrets, but I also believe strongly that the academics can study the fruits of those experiences the same way they have forever in, the, in looking at examples of mainstream religion. I mean, yeah. you could study, uh, you know, the whole story of uh, the, the prophet uh, Elijah, or, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting names here, but um, even uh, in Islam, Muhammad, you know, the night journey. Mm-hmm. I mean, these stories or poems or thoughts or ideas that come out are, those are definitely things that can be studied and analyzed and appreciated, even by somebody who may never have that experience, it still gives us a glimpse into it. Um, yeah, well, and I feel like we might be getting into a subject that could be its, its own oh, conversation sure, yeah. here, but you, you, we've discussed this a number of times in the past, that the, the, the fruits of adeptship, as it were, you know, like, what, what would they be studying? You know, what, what kinds of signs are there that somebody is a... Um, that somebody would be an ascended master or a, you know, or a secret chief or something like that that could be studied. Um, so that, that's a good example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we've talked about this before. I think one of the signs is the ability to heal by touch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there are many examples of this, even in the Catholic Church. Sure. Uh, I went in Montreal to... I can't think of the name now, but the father, I don't want to say Joseph, but they had a, a whole basilica erected to this guy who did thousands, tens of thousands of, of yeah. healings. And to me, that says this person has some level of attainment. It doesn't mean they're a genius or that... Or even relatively a nice guy. You know? Or a nice guy, <laughs> or even that, you know, 
they may be very simple, mm -hmm. but they are invested with that power. Yeah. Each discipline has its own area, and the hardcore historians are not going to be interested in uh, the religionist's uh, point of view, right. which, uh, again, drawback of academia. There's, there's no real holistic way of, of approaching well, right. You mentioned you mentioned a couple of times today that this kind of false dichotomy of scholars versus practitioners, and how there's there's very very often animosity yeah. that goes both ways between the groups. Does, does. Um, I don't know if it's possible to really truly bridge the gap, but I think it's interesting to think about, mm -hmm. and I hope people have enjoyed this and maybe have a few questions. Yeah. Sure. Okay, they can leave them right in the comments and uh, approach that in the next year.